I am not ready for prime time as far as camera work, but I had to bring this to you immediately as soon as I got it. I, I just, I'm going to have to go through this letter point for point because I want you parents to understand why letters like this are so, oh God, I don't even want to begin. This is not benign. You need to understand what's being said in a letter like this and also what's not being said and you need to ask a lot of questions, but let's get going. This was sent out in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. It's not a community where I live. I have a whistleblower there. And it begins, this is from the principal, by the way. It begins, the brain is most interested in survival and has a deep need for relating to others. Well, okay, sure, of course. In the letter to the East community dated January 21st, 2022, I shared our goal for Cherry Hill High School East to be welcoming, be a welcoming learning environment where all students belong. The genesis of this goal stemmed from a moral obligation, a moral obligation. These are public schools to provide a school where we all would want our children to attend. How in the world would you know what that would look like? Let's just stop and pause right there. There's so much to use their word unpack in this. A moral obligation on whom? Seems to me the moral obligation, which would really be a, an ethical obligation because this is a little, you know, public entity, an arm of the state, is to provide the services for which the taxpayers are paying. Okay, that, that would be the only moral obligation I can think of. And most taxpayers expect their kids to go to school, and learn how to read, write, do math, and not get beat up by other students not be treated badly by teachers, not be berated because of their race, not be berated because of their relative you know, wealth, not be told they're good or bad or you know, summed up or told what their identity is, not told to lie to their parents, et cetera. Where, what about those moral obligations? Not to get between a family, not to disrupt a family unit because we know that's happening every day. We know in New Jersey specifically, they have a gender policy of affirmation and lying to parents. They literally keep two separate files and will keep one secret from the parents. And the, the students can be six years old and change their gender and be affirmed by the teachers. But no sense of moral obligation to inform the parents that six-year-olds who very often also believe in Santa and the Tooth Fairy have decided to change their name, become the other gender and so forth and so on. No, there's no obligation there apparently. But to provide a school where all we would all want our children to attend, well, may, very many people don't want their children to attend a school that would keep lot, keep secrets from them. So who's deciding who we all is and who's deciding what that kind of a school would look like? Well, it's certainly not you, is it? Because most parents who have anything negative to say about what the school has decided, what the state has decided, have been described as domestic terrorists. So let's continue. There also exists an educational catalyst for providing a welcoming learning environment for all students. Wow, this is news. When did when was it not? When when did you not have a welcoming environment for all students? When was there a sign on the door saying, since the civil rights era anyway, I'm sorry, you're not welcome. And I find it interesting they have to call this out at a time when the kindergartners in this same district are being made to sit and listen to Not My Idea, a book about whiteness. But definitely, let's make sure all the students feel welcome because otherwise they might not learn unless they're white. Because telling white kids who are six that whiteness is a pact with the devil, literally, and there's an image of a creature holding that pact which is full of lies in and of itself and stereotypes and racial essentialism with a with cloven hooves and a tail. But let's continue. Robust research in brain science has found that stress negatively impacts learning. This is not news to anyone. We know this anecdotally from our own experiences. However, the physiological impacts of stress on the learning process can now be scientifically explained. Yeah, that they've been able to be scientifically explained for a very long time. But anyway... This is not to say that all stress is bad, increased awareness, focus, and performance are some benefits of moderate and short-lived stress. However, extreme or chronic stress can have a negative effect on learning. It is this chronic stress that our students suggest 
in the January 21, 2022 Eastside article that is the byproduct of slurs used by members of the East School community. Really? Really, that's causing the chronic stress? Slurs? Those of us who grew up in the 70s and 80s and remember the comedy of people like Rodney Dangerfield and Richard Pryor and other people, even Eddie Murphy, know full well that slurs are now what cause chronic stress. Even those that are not in jest are not what cause chronic stress. And if we're teaching our children that that's what chronic stress is about, we're weakening them. We're not strengthening them. They're, you're never going to stop people from saying things you don't want to hear, from directing insults at you, etc. I'm not suggesting they should, nor am I saying it's a wonderful rite of passage. I'm simply saying that Equating chronic stress with slurs is beyond the pale ridiculous. When most kids who go through chronic stress are enduring things like, oh, I don't know, the pandemic, wearing masks every day, being told they are vectors of disease, we're going to kill grandma or mom or dad or their teacher or their fellow classmates, and you know, not being able to leave their house, not being able to go play with their friends, not being able to hug anybody, not being able to see their grandparents for two or three years, maybe not or not being able to see them before they died, not being able to visit someone in the hospital, having to go to the hospital and not being visited, having parents who get divorced or have gotten divorced because of all of this stress, having their parents lose their job because of the COVID policies, et cetera, et cetera. Those things cause chronic stress, not slurs, not slurs. That's not chronic stress. That ought to be a momentary stress. But that's what they're saying these kids are describing as chronic stress. And nobody's jumping in to say, maybe we need to do a better job of teaching these kids what stress really looks like. Remember when we were kids? The starving Armenians have no food. The starving kids in China have no food, whatever. I mean, that's what our parents told us to get us to eat our food off our plate. And instead, these kids are like, oh, did someone hurt your feelings? Oh, no, you might not be able to learn. Next steps. Much conversation and work has occurred at East since the publication of the article on January 21st. In speaking with student leaders of our culture clubs, I wonder what those are like, the culture clubs, and they spoke with the student leaders. Why do we get the feeling that these are the loudest complainers in the whole school who have learned their lesson well, that virtue comes with complaining about being a victim? Four themes emerged that have informed our next steps. Committees composed of faculty, staff, administration, guidance counselors, members of our staff, cultural proficiency and equity committee. I was wondering when equity was going to show up. And student members of our culture clubs formed to construct lessons based on the four themes provided by our students. Lesson one, awareness. Students will learn to recognize intentional and unintentional slurs, slights, and other microaggressions. But I'm sure it won't cause any chronic stress to be constantly on the lookout for slurs. You know, just curating them so that you can turn around and tell somebody or do something about it or, you know, get a dossier together of all the slurs that somebody has allegedly thrown your way so you can what? Punish them? Declare your virtue over them? What is the point of this? So we're constantly hypervigilant. You know that hypervigilance? And looking for slurs is literally a form of cognitive distortion that is teaching the behavior of depressed people. Lesson two, self-advocacy. Students will learn appropriate ways of responding when they are the recipient of intentional or unintentional microaggressions. Why do I have a feeling that their definition of appropriate and mine as a parent or yours as a parent would be radically different? Because mine would be along the lines of what we were taught, sticks and stones may break your bones, but you know, you're know you not what other people call you. And keep on walking. Just don't even pay it any heed. I have a feeling there's some triangulation involved. I know they've been instructed to install an app on their phones where they can report these things to adults and keep track of people who are doing it. So I have a feeling their definition of appropriate has something to do with snitching. Could be wrong. Hope I'm wrong. But so far, I've seen no evidence that schools are teaching children to both look for microaggressions and then ignore them. Why would you do that? Why would you teach kids to look for microaggressions only to ignore them? That doesn't seem to make sense, does it? Lesson three, upstander. Students will learn appropriate ways of responding when they are witness to intentional and unintentional microaggressions. Yes. Help 
the person on the receiving end deal with it in the way I described. Getting between a bully and the bullying victim is rarely a good idea. Again, you become the point in the triangle. And why would you do that? That's neither safe nor helpful to the person on the receiving end unless you really know you can get them to back down. Might be better to provide support for the person being bullied and let them know that they are not whatever the bully is saying they are. Surround them with love and acceptance and ignore that other person would be what I would advise. So hopefully that's what they're teaching because that would actually reduce stress and give the child a sense of belonging. Getting in the middle is likely to make things worse. Lesson four, supports resource. Students will learn about the supports and personnel offered and available at East. They will learn how to run crying to the adults to fix their problems. Now, again, I am not suggesting that there aren't kids who are suffering legitimate chronic stress, like I've described at the outset of this video, who might need those supports and resources at the school. But they're informing all the students. They're coming at all the students saying, you might be very stressed out. Here are some things that will probably stress you out. These are things that, you know, are really bad messages that should stress you out. That should cause stress. So now what if you're a kid who goes, that just doesn't really phase me. Are you going to start thinking you're weird? What if you're a kid that it has, you know, autism and is committing all kinds of accidental slights, but you can't figure it out? You don't, you do, I mean, are you the one going for the resources or are other people going to tattle about you? This is the opposite of teaching kids how to be anti-fragile. And anti-fragility is not the same thing as resilience. Resilience is you just snap back to where you were. Anti-fragility is you're stronger than you were at the start. I don't see how this makes these kids stronger. This, this tells them, look for things that should upset you or upset others and be constantly vigilant about that. So maybe you're inserting yourself into other people's issues that aren't their issues. What if the kid goes, oh, I heard what that person said to you and are you upset? Are you okay? Let's go talk to someone and get a resource. What if the kid who's just been slighted is like, I'm good, thanks. I'm good, thanks. Can you just downplay it? Leave me alone. Like, let's not call attention to it. I'm really not interested in giving this any oxygen because there's some people who thrive on drama. They're called teenagers. Anyway, additional information for each lesson. We have kind and wonderful students who make up our school community at East High School. Then why are you suggesting that there are so many slights and microaggressions you need to teach the students to be on the lookout for them and how to go get supports when they happen? I truly believe and agree with the sentiments of our students that the vast majority of slurs, slights, and or behaviors, those spoken or enacted that we would categorize as microaggressions, are unintentional. Well, then they're not aggression, are they? If they're unintentional, just let it slide. What? Why do we need to categorize them? It is my hope that less than well provide our students with, the, with an awareness, why is it in quotes, of the things that they may do or say that are hurtful to their classmates and friends. So they never open their mouths and start a conversation as if they're so great at socializing as it is and as if it's real easy after being away for a couple years to socialize in the first place when the last year of school you had was, you know, like a whole different kind of school. Let's say your middle school and your last grade was like fifth grade or fourth. <laughs> I mean... If your hormones, et cetera, can you even imagine? Now, this is high school. So in this case, their last grade might have been middle school. And they may well be that far behind in their maturation. Hard enough to start to make friends. Maybe they came from a different middle school into this high school. So they really don't know anybody. But we're going to teach you about the slurs. I'm going to teach you they're mostly unintentional. But, you know, that could shift and change too. We know that, right? People are getting canceled for stuff that was okay a week ago. Um, look at Adele. <laughs> I, I'm old enough to remember the Me Too campaign, right? Believe all women. And now you can't get up on a stage and say, I'm proud to be a woman. That's not okay. Anyway, continuing. It is the intention of lesson two to equip students with the tools to appropriately respond to a classmate or friend who is unkind to them. Our students have expressed that they are currently lacking these tools. They are typically, that they typically just laugh it off or ignore the unwanted comment or behavior. Why is that wrong? Why is that wrong? If that's not working internally, if they need some support to deal with how internally the faking it isn't really helping, then maybe encourage them to go talk to someone. But what else do they need? I don't know. I don't see how that's a problem. However, our students also recognize that responding in these ways serves to validate the behavior. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Laughing it off maybe 
ignoring it does not validate it. Quite the opposite. Reacting to it validates the behavior because very often people are trying to get a rise out of you, as my dad would say. They're trying to get a reaction. They feed off that drama. They feed off that power. Not giving them that, generally speaking, causes it to end. Maybe not immediately because they will poke and poke and poke it repeatedly, but it does generally work. So that is bad advice. Responding in these ways serves validate. No, it does not. I've never seen that as the outcome. Many of our students have shared that they've been witness to classmates and our friends joking about another student. They recognize that the joking is wrong and potentially hurtful, but they express feeling ill-equipped to intervene on behalf of the student being targeted. They shouldn't. They shouldn't necessarily intervene. They should go to the student being targeted and say, hey, I hope you don't pay any attention to that because that's BS. And you know, we disagree and that person's a tool <laughs> or whatever. I mean, that would be more helpful. Getting in between, the, unless it's violent, and even then you shouldn't physically put yourself in that situation, it's probably not going to help. Again, now they've allured a group of people into the drama. Ooh, how powerful they are. Rather than being a bystander, lesson three provides our students with the tools to be an upstander. Good luck. I've not seen this work out well in real life. This is how you get groups of people fighting it with groups of people. EAST has a number of supports and resources available to students. These resources and supports are available both in person and remotely. Understanding the anonymous reporting system, stop it, that's the one I was just talking about, and the availability of our student advocate and student assistance counselor, right, the thought police, are just a few of the supports that will be discussed. So don't solve your own problems. There's these adults, there's an app, you know, don't laugh it off, don't ignore it. You know, you've got to do something, you've got to be, now there's this sense of obligation, be an upstander. Why? Like I said, if you want to be an upstander, go to the kid who's being targeted and help them out with that. Talk to them about how they could possibly get help from somebody else. I wouldn't necessarily get in the middle of it. Don't give that fight any oxygen. Lesson enactment. Each of the lessons will be enacted for all students in upcoming days five and six and the following days. They're going to do role playing. But by all means, let's not create an era of chronic stress in the school. We wouldn't want to do that. Lesson one will be enacted in all mathematics classes. Math classes. Lesson two will be enacted in all English classes. Lesson three, you see how they're taking over the main subjects with this SEL garbage? This is SEL, by the way. And they want to train these kids to police others' thoughts using what they call slights. But I can guarantee you that if somebody's called a snow roach, if somebody is made fun of for their whiteness, if somebody is made fun of for you know how much money they have or the fact that they're a normie, they're, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. That's perfectly fine. I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes. They do nothing. They do nothing. In fact, I've seen the so-called restorative justice process turned around on the target of that bullying to say that maybe the kids who are picking on them are asking them in their own way, in their immature way to check their privilege. I've seen that. I have heard that. So there are mixed messages left and right here. And this is not helping these kids mature at all. Partnering with our families. Really? You want to partner now that you've called the parents who criticize anything that you do, domestic terrorists, and you've, you know, agreed with that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going to partner? I don't think so. I'm very proud of the work that our staff and students have done to create lessons that will support an improved school experience for all our students. I'm also very excited to partner with our families in support of this effort. Partner, partner, partner. This is not a partnership. Because like I said, if I or a group of parents went in and said, I really don't want you teaching my kid to nurse slights and to spot them everywhere there might be and to call them microaggressions. Aggression is something intentional. You can't say in one breath it's unintentional aggression. That doesn't make any sense. And if it's unintentional, then why don't you have the kids treat all things the way you would treat those? Because unless they're literally being aggressive, the kid is not you know, being physically harmed, the best thing the kid can do is ignore it. And I've been bullied. So if anyone in the audience is going, you can't ignore bullying and it's horrible and it creates chronic stress. Yes, I know. It does create chronic stress when you're literally bullied. But I also know that unless you're prepared to go after your bully physically or deal with your bully yourself head on, whatever the cost of that, they're not going to stop because you tattle on them. It might get worse. They get more sophisticated. And it spirals out of control. So teaching kids that these things cause chronic stress rather than telling them that they shouldn't, that, you know, 
beefing up their emotional strength to realize that kids who say these things have problems and that is no reflection on them at all, that they're the one with the problem is is probably going to go a lot farther. And then giving them an outlet of, you know, if this is happening to you and you want to come talk to an adult to talk about it, come talk to us. But you probably shouldn't ask us to do anything because that might get worse. We're not going to jump in between you and the other person. We're going to just offer you as much support as we possibly can. Unless, as I said, if that person's being disruptive to the class and to learning directly, then obviously the adults have to do something. This is not so cut and dry as, you know, <laughs> here's how to identify the slights and put them and stop it and it'll make it go away. No, kids are bullying other kids by reporting on them. That's how that's working. All of our families are invited to attend our upcoming virtual PTA meeting on 2-15-22 at 7-15 where we will review the entirety of lesson one to access the PTA meeting, blah, blah, there's the link. At least they're being transparent, giving props for that. East High School will continue our effort to, efforts to work with our students, staff, and families to provide our students with a welcoming learning environment where all students belong. Shortly after the enactment of Lesson 4 on 3, 9, and 3, 10, I will share a letter to update our school community of the additional actions we will be taking to support our students. Teach them something. Like, can you please make sure they can read properly? Because I know for a fact you're not doing that. Okay? I, I know for a fact you're not doing that. I've seen what, what passes for teaching at this school. Okay? Or the middle school right below it, so I can only imagine the high school. If, they're, if this is what's preparing them for your high school... And I can only imagine. So how about you support their actual learning instead of obsessing over all the stress they're allegedly suffering to the point where you create more of it. At that time, I will also share all four of the lessons in their entirety with the families. These lessons will be included in our student Google classrooms and will be available for future use. Thank you for choosing to send your children, like they had a choice, to Cherry Hill East High School. Thank you for entrusting us with their education and thank you for your support. Should you have any questions or concern, et cetera, et cetera. They don't have much of a choice. Mr. Perry, I'm sorry, Dr. Perry. Um, and if they disagree with your approach in terms of how you deal with chronic stress, this is what you think chronic stress is, that these kids feel the chronic stress of microaggressions, then, you know, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. I just, I just think maybe you need to come out to the real world to see what kind of stressors your students are really dealing with, their parents are really dealing with, and stop creating more stress. Just teach them something. Make the classes interesting. Get them involved in the subject matter. Why do they have so much time to be slighting each other? Why do they have so much time to obsess over picking on each other and then looking for people picking on other people to be upstanders, etc.? Why do they have all this extra time and brain space to be dealing with this? Why aren't they so involved in their studies and so involved in learning and so feeling so good about themselves and what they're, how they're growing as learners? You claim that they can't learn material until we get rid of the stress. What if part of why they're so stressed out is they're bored out of their gourds, they're not learning any material, they're not even asked to learn any material, and they have too much time on their hands. They don't know what really matters in the world. They're not striving for anything. They don't feel like they belong in the human race or on planet Earth. You're scaring the living daylights out of them about climate change constantly and racial essentialism. Did it ever occur to you, sir, that part of why they're picking on each other is they've got so much pent up frustration and aggression and they can't go pick on y'all. They can't pick on the adults. So they pick on each other. Maybe go look in a mirror and start thinking about what lessons you're actually teaching these kids and stop navel gazing about microaggressions. It's not a good cover up for the lack of academic rigor at your school. It's not. We're on to you. Anyway, that's what I had to share with you so quickly that I didn't uh, bother to comb my hair or get ready for the camera. But I hope you understand that these letters are not just these benign little letters. You need to read between the lines and you need to ask more questions. What I say all the time on this channel, ask why. Don't take what they say for granted. Ask what, why do they need to be doing this? And compared to what? what th this is chronic stress compared to what? Compared to not knowing how to read properly? Compared to not learning anything in the classroom or having the class classes be boring and everything's on a Chromebook? Check, how, uh, their, check their skills first. 
they're a school. Their moral obligation, the moral obligation, this up here, moral obligation right here is to teach, not to manage your children's emotions. That's more your moral obligation and your child's once they're of a certain age. Anyway, thanks for listening and I will see you later. Um, please subscribe to the channel, like, share, comment, and join my locals at the reason we learn.locals.com. Have a great day.